are often worth than not. But its best thing is it's a massive simplification of the system, huge simplification of the system. You're no longer, if you're a benefit a claimant, having to apply to three places, local authority, job centre, HMRC for tax credits. It's one place and the certainty in your, in your benefits. And why am I going on about this in this, in this context? Is because your delay as a Northern Ireland in implementing this might mean that you can move much more quickly to universal credit from the current system. And universal credit not only will affect people at the bottom, but it will affect people higher up as well. It will make it much easier to redistribute from people earning more to those at the, the bottom, because finally we'll have an integration of the tax and benefit system. And that will afford um, the reduction in the overall welfare bill, which we need to cut the deficit and invest in infrastructure and invest in healthcare, um, without penalising the people at the bottom in quite the way that it is with such the complicated system we have at the moment. Any more questions from the floor? I'm sure there's going to be one or two. Yeah, we've got two over here. We'll be go to the back of the room first and then move up to the front. Uh, Nigel Perriman from the Housing Finance Corporation. Quick, um, quick comment on the universal credit. Um, we're a lender to the sector and we credit assess a number of associations. What, what we found um, over the last few years is that associations have done a great job reducing their staff levels and um, with the implementation of welfare reform and, and universal credit, staff numbers have now gone up. So I take what you mean about it simplifies it in some cases, but I think you have to recognise this is putting a lot of cost into housing associations when they're trying to cut cost. Um, and I think you know, th th there are times to sort of take on expensive projects. And I think in a time sort of, of austerity, this maybe wasn't the best time to sort of put a lot of extra costs into housing associations. Yeah. It's certainly not the best time to do it. You you definitely want to embark upon a major reform um, when you have money in to ease the transition. Um, so I, I accept, I certainly accept that. But I, I think it's such an important and fundamental reform, not least in some of the advantages. I think there's... Um, uh, Oxford, uh, I think it was Oxford City Council in terms of taking over direct payments to housing tenants. They were part of sort of the early experiment. And uh, actually they are going to continue with uh, the direct payments uh, um, part of the universal credit because they, they've established a relationship with their tenants they didn't really have before. And there are big advantages um, in that sense. And also you know, a lot of the things that people have to do in order to receive universal credit like apply online, are skills that people need. Um, a lot of the skills that you need in terms of only being paid once a month rather than weekly. Um, all sorts of support services, um, universal support that's coming in to help people apply for universal credit. People who are using universal credit are developing all sorts of new skills um, in order to survive in the system. And the question is, perhaps, pertinent to what you just said, is there enough resources to ensure those support services are there? But I think we have to seize the opportunity and think that if we can make this work, um, there's advantages, um, much wider advantages than people being paid more in work. There's the skills that people acquire as part of the, the whole package. We had a question up here in the second row, Sharon, if you were able to... Leslie Morell. You should be on, okay. Leslie Morell, Oakley Trinity. I've been around a long time, longer than perhaps even you imagine. <laughs> I started young. <laughs> and having been around a long time, I served on a council which had planning powers, a county council. So I am gravely concerned that now as we move into a regime in this province where local authorities will once again have full planning authority, that to use Cameron's metaphor, where we were swimming in treacle through planning, which we all know holds up our development program more than anything else, we will be swimming through something like a rice pudding in future. It is going to be incumbent upon housing associations to get people within the local authorities who will push their case 
who will fight for them. And I'm wondering if our panel have any wrinkles from their experience as lobbyists as to how best housing associations can make friends and win influence within the new local authorities. Thank you. Paul, that maybe is best with you. Um, <coughs> well, certainly I, I, I give you some sense of that um, uh, at the end of, of my, the, the, my former presentation. But, and, you know, we, we've done a number of these things uh, in England uh, where it's part of the, the policy and will become part of the policy uh, after the reform, the statement of community involvement. And, I mean, and typically where there is no um, community opposition uh, and where you are policy compliant, there should be no reason why actually the new system will be, uh, will, will, you know, will actually be better. I, I have, believe it or not, uh, and I have long experience in planning in Northern Ireland, uh, confidence that if it's done right, then decisions will be made quicker uh, in the new environment. Um, and I think, but the, the, the community engagement piece, the, the statement of community involvement, the early engagement and understanding and support uh, of the community, plus proper process um, uh, in relation to policy compliance, uh, planning applications, uh, environmental issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if you do those two things in parallel at the right time, I, I'm, believe it or not, uh, encouraged that uh, it, it will be better. I'm slightly more cynical. What about you, Jim? What would your view be? Um, well, I, I, I think, unfortunately, the lesson here is any sort of institutional change always takes a long time to, to sort of bed in. Um, and obviously, we've seen that the whole sort of reform of public administration taking, you know, I don't know how many years longer than it was supposed to take. Uh, we now have the shadow councils and so on, and then the new powers uh, that will flow from that. Uh, so, yeah, I suppose you could apply a health, healthy dose of cynicism as to whether or not they'll be up and running uh, quickly, but I think Paul's right in theory, it should be better, bringing it closer. Uh, we know there were problems before, uh, but hopefully with a bit more openness and accountability that, that we can avoid those again in the future. Uh, just, to, just to add to that, I suppose, um, I think one of the big bugbears for, for elected officials, many of whom have transferred from the old councils into the new councils, obviously there's some new ones, uh, see Jeff Dudgeon down there uh, as well, just elected to Belfast, but um, I think one of the big bugbears has been planning, and, and I think if there's a determination, uh, because it was so bad in the past, I think there's an added determination, albeit there is institutional change, albeit there's serious uh, learning curve to be, um, uh, you know, to be gone through, and also um, a transfer of, of people and officials and so on from the planning service into councils and all of that involves. But I think because it's been so bad, um, I think there's an extra determination to try and make it better. In the, new, uh, in the new environment. I think that's a fair point and actually we've been doing a lot of work with Northern Ireland Water, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency on some of the delays that hold up the planning process and taking that collaborative approach and working together we, we certainly are seeing results. I'm going to risk Lucinda's wrath with one more question if anybody has one. She's got a big red sign that says stuff on it um, but I, I'll take one more quick question if anyone has one. Should have known. <laughs> Paul, just uh, all, all associations, I think, recognise that they need to do more in terms of political engagement, both at Stormont and at the local authority level. Could you give two or three very short pointers to associations in terms of practical, uh, you know, easy steps or, 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 or less expensive steps that they can take to kick off that process? Well, ju just to say. Uh, in that second last slide there, I, I traced out sort of three or four levels because at a, at a regional level, you know, you have a representative role for all of the, all of the associations. So some, some coordination in relation to what you're saying on behalf uh, of the entire sector um, is important to save time because resources are, uh, uh, re resources are careful. Obviously from a policy perspective, the housing executive is extremely important from a landlord's perspective and so on as well. So a degree of coordination will save time and a coherence of messaging in that sense. Um, I think the, the, the other sort of key issues are, you know, to engage locally because I mean, most of you will have local issues to deal with and that the information that you provide is clear, concise, uh, true, um, not made up, um, evidence-based, mm -hmm. uh, independently verified, uh, and that when you have that, that it's given in an honest and open way on a regular basis. 
I mean, I, you know, it's, it's hard uh, beyond those kind of big principles, which it may seem obvious, um, but quite often in our experience don't, don't happen. Um, uh, you know, the, the, you, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a good opportunity there for you. I suppose the, the other couple of things is, is to use the media with care uh, and to do it in a way uh, after, you know, not to position people in the media uh, before they actually know what their, what their position should be. So in other words, engage with politicians and so on uh, in advance of, of doing things in the media that might corner them or might, um, you know, deliberately put them into a position where they have to stand up uh, against you. So be really careful about how you do that. Uh, and indeed, uh, as Jim said earlier, to use, um, uh, you know, electronic media and social media to, for as wide an engagement as possible. Okay, thank you. My thanks to our panel for their observations and analysis this morning. I think it's going to set the context for discussion over the next couple of days. We're moving to lunch now. Can I just encourage you over the lunch break to please visit our exhibition um, and also the NIFA stand um, where you can um, keep the debate going, be caught on film. I know some of you have been refusing this morning. I would, uh, I would urge you um, to have your say and take part in one of our box pops um, and talk about some of the themes we've been covering this morning. Uh, for lunch, you just need to turn left out of the side doors. And can I just ask you to uh, show your appreciation for our panel? <laughs>